A guten Erev Shabbos. Well, life is what happens while you're busy making other plans. Our education brochure this year has the design of the Haggadah, familiar to many of us who used it over the years at our Seder tables. And the hope was to have an in-depth conversation about the Haggadah in some of our regular Torah study sessions and some of the talks over Shabbat. You see, this year we have 51 Shabbosim in which to read the entire Chumash, not counting Shabbos, that's Yom Tif. And almost half of the parshas uh, ha- not, uh, uh, contain verses that are either part of our Haggadah or directly related to the Seder night. So the thought was each week when there are verses that show up in the Parsha that are also in the Haggadah, we would go a little bit more in depth into those. And then we had a grim reminder from a passage in the Haggadah that does not come from the Chumash, but quite suddenly appeared right in front of us in real life. The passage is not long after the four sons or the four children, and it starts, V'hi she'amda. I'm sure most of us have heard about it or thought about it lately. It says, and this, it, it, it is this that has stood by our ancestors and us, for not only one has risen up against us to destroy us, but in every generation they rise up against us to destroy us. And the Holy Blessed One rescues us from their hands. V'hi she'amda lavosenu velanu shelo yechad bilvad it was six weeks ago, six Shabbos mornings ago, that we woke up to find ourselves in a different era of Jewish life, a new era defined by a moment, a very unfortunate and horrible moment, much like 1973, like 1967, some say even that this transformative moment has the power of 1948. Shana and I heard a speaker last week quote no less an authority than Xiao Wenlai. They asked him what he thought of the French Revolution and he said, famously, it's too soon to tell. It's too soon to tell what this era will mean for us and the next generations because we're right in the middle of it and we have no idea what what its effects will be. We're very grateful for the safe release of some hostages, and we continue to pray for the safe release and long life of the rest. We look forward to hearing more good news and seeing peace. Okay, let's not dwell on the negative aspects of that. It's enough. Let's focus really on the positive, that Jews in Israel are united with one another and helping each other. At the moment, there are numerous people from, Kehilat, from the Kehillat Shari Torah family right now volunteering in Israel, helping out with whatever needs to be done, and there is a lot. I heard this week from a friend who was a Navy frogman and then became a psychologist to help fellow IDF soldiers deal with post-traumatic stress. He's in the U.S. right now raising money to support soldiers and displaced families who went through the traumas of the past weeks. We are, of course, gearing up for a trip to Ottawa a week from Monday to let the nation's lawmakers know where we stand. If you've not registered yet for the bus, please do that right after Shabbat, if there are still places. But we ought never to forget that passage from the Haggadah, that in every generation they rise up to destroy us. A lot of us youngins have been saying that it's been a very good run over the last 50 years, a lot of material success and well-being a lot of growth in intellectual and scientific fields for the Jewish people, a relatively secure Israel, a relatively secure Jewish community in North America. So if we sat at the Seder in recent years and said, in every generation they tried to destroy us and a Kaddosh Baruch Hu saves us from their hand, and someone asked a question about, what does that all mean? Who's trying to destroy us now? It would have been a good question. And up until this last Pesach, we might not have had a great answer. Maybe we would have said, well, it's good to remember history, or, well, you never know, history teaches us, or some other answer that usually induces eye-rolling in the younger generation. This year, come Pesach, we'll have a clear answer, far too clear for anyone's tastes. 
It's not a great use of our time to explain why this happens over and over again. Uh, there was a sign at the rally in Washington that said, Mom was right, they are mean because they are jealous, which is what moms tell their kids who get picked on at school. People are mean because they want to keep you down. It's too hard for them to rise up to your level, so they drag you down to theirs. This may be true, and it certainly resonates with what one of the commentaries on this passage from the Haggadah cites as a Gemara and Shabbos, noting the similarity between Sinai and Sina, between Mount Sinai, where we stood together, and Sina, the word for hatred that others seem to feel for us for no logical reason, they can't seem to get over. Even though the words are spelled differently, the suggestion here is that it's our very uniqueness and that we know who we are and what we stand for and what we have to do. And by the way, it doesn't involve any violence or taking of anything that someone else's. That awakens this unreasonable, illogical, pathological hatred of us that we've seen unleashed around the world in these past six weeks. What is worth figuring, uh, using our time, is to figure out our part in the ongoing survival and flourishing of our people. And one key to that, according to the Haggadah, is found in our Torah portion this week of Vayetze. Yaakov has just left his home and headed to Haran and has this dream of a ladder and angels along his way. He arrives at the house of Lavan and works there for 14 years while he earns the right to marry first Leah, then Rachel. And along the way, Yaakov fathers eventually 12 sons and a daughter. This is called Beis Yaakov, the house of Jacob. In next week's Parsha, he'll wrestle with an angel and will change his name to Yisrael, Israel, and here we are. But an incident with Lavan from Parsha's Vayetze earns mention in the Haggadah right after Vehi Sha'amda. We read in the Haggadah, Tseu Lamad, go and learn, Ma bikesh Lavan ha'arami la'sois le'yakov. What did Lavan, the Aramean, plan to do to Jacob, our forefather? Sheparai loy gazar el azcharim. Parai, Pharaoh, only decreed against the males. But the Lavan bikesh la'karas akol. Lavan tried to uproot everything, to destroy, murder everyone. What was Lavan's plan? Our Parsha in chapter 31 sees Yaakov overhearing the words of Lavan's sons. Yaakov has worked hard all these years to earn everything he has. God has blessed him with success and wealth. But Lavan's children are jealous, and they say that really everything Yaakov has should belong to us. It's really our father's wealth that he took. He didn't really earn it himself. Does this sound familiar at all? Yaakov says to his family, that's it, time to leave. There's no sense in trying to reason with these people. Pack your bags. They leave, they flee Haran, headed for Gilad, but Lavan finds out about it and chases them down. In typical fashion of those who accuse us, Lavan accuses Yaakov of everything that he himself is guilty of. Remember that Lavan had tricked Yaakov into marrying Leah, the older daughter, before Rachel, the younger, as we read in the opening of the portion. Remember that whatever Yaakov is able to gain in wealth from his breeding of sheep, recounted in the portion in considerable detail, Lavan and later his sons proclaim it's really theirs. Lavan accuses Yaakov of deceit, which the text itself says Yaakov left without informing Lavan of his plan to depart. So when Lavan catches up with Yaakov and his family, he tells them, you know, I could have hurt you if I'd wanted to. Yesh le'el yadi lasos ra, he says. And in fact, his intention was to kill Yaakov and his family. That's why we say, Arami oved avi. The Aramean tried to murder our patriarch Yaakov. But Lavan admits that he's received a message from God in a dream, telling him not to harm Yaakov. So he follows through on that. The commentators all note that there was more to the dream, that Lavan did not recount to Yaakov, still more evidence of his dishonesty. And when Lavan confronts him, Yaakov lists no fewer than six arguments about his own integrity and honesty. One, that Lavan rifled through all his possessions and found nothing stolen. That he worked for Lavan for 20 years and never showed a loss on the business. Third, he never took from the business for his personal use. Fourth, that he absorbed the costs of any animals that were lost to predators. 
Fifth, that he worked year round, day and night, in drought and cold. And finally, that he, that he served the agreed upon term, seven years before the first chuppah, seven for the second, and six more years for the livestock. I've earned everything I've got, he says. What's Lavan's answer? It's all mine. No less an authority than the Chavetz Chaim says that this is the way it is in Galus, in exile. And this attitude is the point of view of anti-Semitic ideology through the ages. We work with honesty and integrity as best we can to make the society around us prosperous, and in the end, we are forced out. Fortunately, fortunate to escape with the shirts on our backs, grateful to have our lives. Yet, at the end of this encounter, the two men are able to agree on a treaty, mainly stipulating conditions and limitations on Yaakov, and also agreeing to a border that would not be violated. You know how those borders are. And at the end, in the last verses of the portion, we see Yaakov leaving the precincts of Lavan and heading home to Israel. As soon as he leaves Lavan's area, with its smell of deceit and trickery, he's immediately met by angels again, who were with him at the beginning of the Parsha in the dream about the latter. Couldn't we use some more angels shielding us along the journey also?